pleasure in introducing our guest speaker, Malcolm James Acosta, ACCBO, CWAQC. I'm not going to tell you the stories behind all those letters. It might take a little while, but it does tell us what a distinguished career um, Malcolm Acosta has had in the law and in Western Australia. The interesting thing was he started primary school at North Perth Primary School. He actually started life in Subiaco. He hasn't moved far from home. At, Subi at North Perth Primary School, there were a number of Jewish children and they were able to win awards and come uh, on scholarships to Perth Modern School and then on to university, uh, a path which Malcolm himself took. And so we do welcome you and look forward to what you have to tell us today. Thank you very much for that introduction, mercifully short. Um, <coughs> ladies and gentlemen, it's an honour to be here to commemorate Crystal Night. It's uh, a very important thing that we should remember forever, and that is to ensure that it is remembered forever. I just ask you this exercise of imagination for a moment. Imagine that you're a young girl, aged, say, 11, living in Berlin in 1938. You've been expelled from school, which you love, for no reason other than your Jew. You know that your father has been prevented from continuing in his job in the civil service for no reason other than he's a Jew. You're walking along on the 10th of November 1938 along the street and suddenly you see men smashing windows. And the windows of, of businesses and houses owned by Jewish people. And you saw other men bashing people, men and women, mainly women, bashing them for no other reason than that they're Jewish. And you, as a girl, recognize some of those people. They're friends, some are even distant relatives. You run home. Mum, what's going on? Where's Dad? Mum says, Dad's been taken away. You've probably never seen him again. And that was the start of Crystal Night. And that happened in one part of Germany, but it happened all over Germany. It happened the same evening in Austria and in the Sudeten land, places which the uh, Nazi Germany had by then and next. How did all that happen? How did it come about? Particularly in a country like Germany, known over many decades for its civilization, for its musicians, its poetry, its artists. How could that happen? It didn't come on the 10th of November 1938, just out of the blue. There was a build-up to it. When Hitler took power in January 1933, he immediately started on a campaign of vilification and oppression against the Jewish people. It happened little by little, and no one, or a few of any, stood up to stop it. Perhaps they weren't brave enough to stop it, to try to stop it. Perhaps they simply thought, well, this was a step that wouldn't be followed by such another step. Indeed, many Germans in those early years thought that Hitler's power would very, very soon disappear, but it didn't. And so, Jews were banned from practicing law, practicing medicine, uh, being in the civil service, but the children ultimately could not go to public schools and were expelled, those that were in public schools, like the little girl I mentioned. They were prevented from going, to, from, they were expelled from those schools for no other reason than they were Jewish. 
They were deprived of voting rights. They were treated as outcasts, as dogs. And many people, to their great shame, in Germany, who know Jewish people have been friends over not only one generation but many generations, they nevertheless turned them, turned their backs on them, wouldn't stand up. And these were people, some of these Jewish people, who regarded Germany quite understandably as their homeland and had done so for generations. Many of them had, for men had fought in the First World War and some had been awarded high distinction for their service to the country. Well, going to 1938 and the Kristallnacht led up to it, in October 1938, Hitler, by decree, deported 17,000 uh, Jews who were living in Germany. Deported them to Poland because they had originally, or their ancestors had originally come from Poland. They were arrested and sent back in the most appalling conditions. One of the members of one of these families, a young lad called Herschel, who was 17 years old at the time, happened to be away from Germany and living in uh, Paris with his uncle. And Herschel heard about this and heard that his father and mother and his siblings had all been sent off. Uh, some had been deported, the male had been deported, uh, back to Poland. He couldn't bear the thought. And in the spirit of, you might say, bravery, but some would say folly, he raced to the German consulate in Paris, intending, as an act of revenge, to kill the German consul. As it happened, the German consul wasn't there, so he killed the, uh, the next senior diplomat, who, as it happened, was not a Nazi supporter. But that incident was an isolated incident. He was arrested, of course, in uh, Paris. But, but that was enough to be seized on by Nazi Germany as a pretext for what then followed Kristallnacht. And the decree went out in October, October the 9th, 1938, sorry, November the 9th, 1938. The decree went out that Jewish properties and Jewish people were to be attacked, vandalised, and no one was to assist, no one was to stop. <coughs> one incident that uh, struck me was where a synagogue was burning because a thousand synagogues right across Germany and Austria were burned that night and vandalised churches. Once that struck me was that when one of the synagogues was on fire in one of the smaller towns in Germany, the fire brigade, true to its duty, came racing up, and the fire brigade captain got out and got the hose and about ready to douse the perhaps, extinguish the flame, and then the Nazi who was standing by said, don't turn the water on. Well, the, the captain of the fire brigade was about to remonstrate, so what's going on? And one of his friends said, don't say a word, the enemy is watching. So that was an atmosphere of fear that existed in those times. So imagine the horror and the disbelief that people felt just at Crystal Night. But of course, as you all know, I think, Crystal Night was just a prelude to what horrors then followed. It's very, very difficult to comprehend just what it must have been like in those times. The uh, eminent Paul Ostriker, that you may have heard of, now an Anglican priest uh, and a human rights activist, was six years old at the time and living in Berlin at the time of Crystal Night. His father was a Christian, a practicing Christian, but born to Jewish parents. And he was forbidden to continue working as a doctor. Paul, Paul Ostreicher, and his mother and father had fled to Berlin from a small town in Germany where they were experiencing extreme repression. And Paul was kept hidden uh, in the basement of some non-Jewish friends in Berlin, while his father went from consulate to consulate, that's overseas consulates, 
trying to find one country that would take them so they could escape because he could see what was coming. So they could escape from Germany before things became really much worse. On the actual on the day of Christmas night, Paul's mother, who was non-Jewish, and therefore had committed an unpardonable sin of marrying a Jewish man, unpardonable by the Nazi standards. They're walking along a Berlin street when Jack Booth's troops jumped out of trucks wielding wielding wooden clubs and they uh, at intervals along the street and smashed windows, apartment buildings and so forth, all aimed at Jewish people as well as bashing any Jewish man they saw. So what was to be done? As they were hidden, the family were hidden uh, by a sympathetic member, in fact, of the Nazi party. So as Paul Ostricker later commented, in times of crisis, people are not always what they seem to be, because here was someone who was a member of that party, probably because he knew that otherwise he would not succeed anyway, uh, but still giving the sucker to the family. His family ultimately managed to get a visa to New Zealand. It cost them money, and had, they had to raise sufficient funds to not only meet the fare, but actually to pay for the visa. And uh, most refugees, would-be refugees, couldn't possibly raise any money, so they were stuck in Germany. In New Zealand, it was only 1,000 German, Austrian and Czech Jews. 1,000, not much for a big country. But at least they got away. Paul's grandmother had hoped to join them, but she couldn't. And she was taken and died in the Holocaust. <coughs> And a Perth man, a friend of mine, told me how his Jewish father, when a young man living in Germany, used to deliver parcels for a German Jewish company, a business in Germany. And he used to deliver them across the border. And on, on the night of Crystal Night, he of course being totally innocent of what was going to happen on the 9th of November, he was stopped at the border by two German Nazi guards and they turned out to be his school friends and he thought what's going to happen here and they said listen cross the border and do not come back or your life will be in danger so he did so as Paul Ostricker remarked sometimes people are not quite what they see uh, and we should never ever think that all Germans would be uh, there are a lot of good people in Germany. Many, of course, too afraid to speak up or stand up. Some did. And just last month, another former Jewish refugee died. As a young boy, he'd experienced Crystal Night firsthand in Berlin. Uh, he died, Sir Clive Callum, who, with his father and mother, had managed to escape Berlin and get to England just before the outbreak of the Second World War. And on the 10th of November 1938, his father had been arrested by the Germans for no other reason than he was Jewish and interned in a concentration camp until his wife managed with a bribe of 50,000 marks, a huge sum of money, to the Germany Gestapo to secure his release. He arrived in England with his parents, they were flat broke, of course, and with almost no English. He, like many other German Jewish refugees and Austrian Jewish refugees, made an enormous contribution to the country of their adoption. He to England, as I say, he ended up Sir Clive, originally Klaus Calvin. Although immigration for Jewish adults to Britain remained very restricted, even after Crystal Lake, the British House of Commons, to its great credit, passed a resolution of absolute revulsion against Germany, condemning it, and decided that they would embark upon a program of having young Jewish children, that is, anyone who was 17 years or less, come to Britain. Not their parents, but this became what was known as kinder transport. And to its great credit, 
Britain brought two uh, to Britain from Germany and Austria uh, a large number uh, of children who were refugees, some were from orphanages of course, uh, some were, some found that their parents had been taken and uh, so they were in a bad way, but nevertheless a large number were taken, in all some 7,500 children were taken by Britain. I was reminded of this recently when again another eminent British um, Jewish refugee Professor Sir Gunther Triton died, his picture was, was published, and again, what a great contribution to the law that man made. But he was far from being the only one of those kidney transport kids that uh, survived adversity and went on to achieve great things. Now, despite the fact that Britain had offered this uh, means of of escape from these the German children, the Jewish children. The United States, to its discredit, and this was Franklin Roosevelt, refused to allow such a program. And the reason he gave was simply one of politics. He said it would be politically unpopular. So he didn't stand up at all at that stage. Um, The seeming indifference then of the Western Democrat democracies towards the plight of Jews, coupled with the infamous Munich Agreement uh, in September 1938, when the British and the French allowed Germany to occupy the Sudeten and Czechoslovakia, for peace in our time, so called, encouraged the Nazis to take more and more serious, severe action against the Jewish people, uh, both in Germany and in the occupied countries. <laughs> Um, it was not because of the barbaric treatment of the Jews and other, country, other minorities by Germany, but because of Germany's invasion of Poland in September 1939, that uh, Britain and France finally declared war on Germany. And one may wonder, it's easy to look back, whether if at some early stage in Germany's progressive uh, treatment mistreatment of Jews, these countries had stood up to Germany and voiced their strong displeasure, perhaps even imposed sanctions if they could, whether that might have prevented what then followed, which of course was the Holocaust. Speaking of upstanders, Eli Rabinowitz was here this evening, um, of We Are Here Foundation, has provided us information about a most extraordinary and upstanding human being, the late William Cooper, an Aboriginal activist and leader of his community in Victoria. When William read about Kristallnacht in November 1938, he was an Aboriginal leader. He was so upset and incensed that he organised a delegation of Aboriginal men and women to march to the office from their hometown, from the country town, march to the office of the German consulate in Victoria, Melbourne, and proceeded to present to the German consul a letter of protest against what the Germans were doing to the Jews. The German consul refused to accept the letter, as perhaps might have been expected in those days. Nazi will dominate. But the mere presentation of that letter made William Cooper something of a hero, not only to the Jewish people, but indeed to his own people, standing up for the oppressed. And as a privilege, or as a, a post-privilege, I should say to all that, in 2017, nearly 80 years after that incident, 88 year old Alfred Turner, grandson of William Cooper travelled to Berlin where the German government did accept at last William Cooper's letter from him and thanked him for it. And the son of Alfred Turner, I understand, Lance, uh, the news of birth, is here this evening with his wife Mary. So welcome, Lance and Mary.
He, William, was definitely an upstander. He wasn't content to simply stand by and do nothing at all. He had the courage to speak out what he believed to be right and the hope of making a difference. But it's easy to be judgmental about those who participate in some of the Nazi atrocities against the Jews and the Gypsies and the Poles and indeed against the Russians. Under threat of death yourself, or death of threat or arrest of your family, or in some cases you're a soldier under threat of being sent to the Eastern Front, which they thought was worse than a threat of death. A person may do some very bad things against his or her moral conscience. And that's the dilemma that we face when we talk about standing up for what is right. How far will people go to stand up for what is right? Consider, for example, the prisoners in the infamous Auschwitz death camp who are conscripted under threat of torture and death to inflict such horrors on other prisoners, including sending them to the crematorium to the gas chamber. Uh, described in the book The Volunteer by, uh, about a man, Watol, some of you may have read about the uh, Watol, a Polish resistance fighter, who deliberately got into Auschwitz as a prisoner, got in, easy enough apparently, um, in order to find out just what was going on and then to send records and, and reports about what was going on, the horrors, to the Western democracies. And he succeeded in doing it. To, to, to no avail, because the countries to whom he sent this information just couldn't quite comprehend it. They, they said this can't be happening. Because he was talking about the, in effect, the industrial genocide that was taking place in this and other, other uh, concentration camps. Two things about that story stuck in my mind. <coughs> One was that Wadhol himself said, the, the Polish resistance fighter, who had to take part in some of these awful things that were going on and saw a great deal, he said he started to think he was becoming almost immune to these horrors. It, they were so, so unspeakably bad. Until one day, when he was watching a group of Jewish people taken from a train and ushered towards with certain death, he saw a little baby cry in the arms of a mother. <coughs> and uh, at that stage, he broke down. He's, that was, he said, he didn't realise the inhumanity that was taking place. <coughs> the other thing that struck me about that story was that there were photographs of various prisoners and some guards. And there was a photograph, full page, of three handsome young men looking to be in their late teens, perhaps early twenties, in Nazi uniform. They were looking like their mother's pride and joy, happily laughing. And they were guards who took part in these bestial torments and deaths in Auschwitz. And there they were, looking happy as Larry, and any mother would be proud looking at them to say, that's my son. How could they be happy doing that? And I think the answer is, these people are born evil. They're not. They're made, they're conditioned to become part of an evil project. Perhaps you've seen the film Deny. It's about, it's a true story of a young American Jewish journalist, Deborah Lipstadt. She publicly, called, she publicly called out David Irving, the great Holocaust denier. She said he was a liar and a fraud for that because she was taken to court for defamation by David Irving. And she, or the British barrister, David Irving, uh, David, uh, sorry, Richard Rampton, QC, satisfied the court that in fact she was right. Irving was a liar, the Holocaust certainly did take place. Before the trial began, 
Rampton if you see the visitors in Auschwitz insisted on doing that. Uh, and the mark of a, of a good lawyer, Queen's Counsel, is to familiarise familiarize yourself with the particular location so you understand more, more realistically what took place. And he came back and his client, Deborah, said, you're looking terribly sad and dejected. I can understand that the thought of what happened there must be almost too much to bear. And he said, yes, that's true. But he said, the other thing that I find difficult to bear, extremely difficult to bear, is to, is to answer the question, what would I have done if I had been there in that Auschwitz camp as a prisoner and asked, demanded the commander to take part in those atrocities? He said, I can't truly answer that question. And that's what really dejects me. I don't know whether I'd be strong enough we have to have the moral fortitude to stand up to those Nazi beasts. So to be an upstander, not a bystander, is not always easy. But we all must do our best. It is a great concern that there has been over the last few years an alarming growth in anti-Semitism throughout the world including Australia. In June of this year, such was the concern that a conference was held in Berlin called the Transatlantic Wave of Anti-Semitism, dealing with the problems that had arisen both in Europe and the USA. And you've no doubt all read much of what's been going on, and that's just the tip of the iceberg. Just last week, the city of Dresden, we got quite recently mentioned in Germany, took action to try to prevent uh, what is seen as an enormous tide of racial vilification and attacks on Jewish people and property in Dresden, as well as attack, I must say, by German people on, that's right-wing fascists, you might call it, on Muslims, not only uh, Jews, but Muslims being the targets. In England, there have been similarly, as you know, outbreaks of anti-Semitism. And indeed, a particularly worrying thing in England, I must say, without being too political about it, is that Jeremy Corbyn's side of the Labour Party has shown a distinct, I'd say, favouritism or favouring towards uh, anti-Semitism. At least that's what's alleged. So much so indeed that it was announced this week that by some of the members of the Labour Party in Britain, that they weren't going to support him in his uh, campaign next month, in the election campaign, and indeed would urge Labour supporters to vote against him. That's how bad that appears to be. Well, and this year, another alarming instance, the public school in Melbourne, a little boy, six years old Jewish boy, was forced to kneel and kiss the feet of another boy under threat of violence, the boy calling him Jewish vermin and a Jewish cockroach. That's bad enough. But all of this was filled by several fellow students on their cameras, on their, on their uh, phones. And it got into the media. The very good investigative journalist Excellent. In fact, Gemma Tonini wrote about this in the West Australia, and she said, this isn't the run of the mill schoolyard bullying. Your average school bullying incident doesn't typically involve some kid calling another a dirty Jew or cockroach. It's the language of racial vilification. It's hate speech, and we have no place for this in Australia. She reported, as we reported elsewhere, there's been a 60% increase in anti-Semitic incidents in Australia with incidents of assault and abuse and vandalism and graffiti. And during the last federal election campaign, you may recall, last year, Josh Frydenberg, our treasurer, had his office to face with swastikas and anti semitic graffiti. Gemma posed a question, I genuinely wonder if perhaps this next generation is so far removed from the horrors 
of a Holocaust waiting years ago. Both in educational setting and perhaps with a, with a passing of family members who may have remembered, but it now means very little to them. But the fact that there was a real solid practice in Buddha and wiping out an entire people has become somewhat wispy, like fog in our collective conscientiousness and our memory. And she reminds us of the words <coughs> of the Jewish writer Primo Levi, an Austrian survivor, who said, it happened, therefore it can happen again. This is the core of what we have to say. It can happen, and it can happen everywhere. Chilling words, and Gemma said, why may we all have the courage to prove Primo Levi wrong? And how very sad, indeed tragic, that when that six-year-old Jewish boy in Melbourne was being taunted, none of his fellow students had the courage to come forward and stand up for him against his tormentors. I recently saw, you may have seen it, a very good video produced by some US students in the USA um, public school and they, had a, they produced a series of videos uh, in which they acted out various bullying situations where, for example, one student would be bullied, bullied by three or four other students, verbally abused, sometimes physically. And then another one of the students would come up and stand up for the bullied student. And then that would in turn lead to some of the other students who've been bystanders coming up and joining in, joining in to assist the poor person or student who has been bullied. And that's the kind of precept that I know that our schools us, are trying to instill in our students and it must continue to be instilled in them. They should stand up to bullies. It's morally wrong, it's morally wrong not to stand up and be counted. In the well-known words of Martin Nemo, he said, and he went to a concentration camp in Germany, he said, first the Nazis came for the communists. And I didn't speak up because I wasn't a communist. Then they came for the Jews. I didn't speak up because I wasn't a Jew. Then they came for the trade unionists. I didn't speak up. I wasn't a trade unionist. And they came for me. There was no one to speak up for me. Mm. And they're important words to remember. If you don't stand up for others because you're not part of their play, eventually you might find that no one stands up for you when you have such a play. Now, one other thing that has occurred which I think heightens the problem that we have in looking at anti Semitism, and that's social media. Social media and gaming forums have heightened this concern that young people may be radicalised and indoctrinated to become racist. The uh, Federal Labor MP, counter-terrorist expert Annie Alley, warned of this after a special investigation showed how right-wing extremists are using online gaming forums to post sick comments applauding Christchurch mosque max murderer Brenton Tarrant as a hero and giving vile tips for carrying out mass murders of Muslims and Jews and mocking the Holocaust, complete with swastikas and gas chambers, depictions. So it really is important that we are constantly aware of the lessons that are to be drawn from the Holocaust. And that the lesson is not confined to standing up for oppressed Jews, important though that is, we must ensure that we stand up and, and urge others to stand up for all people who are oppressed. As Eli Weiffel said, I think Bissell said, and he was um, an Auschwitz survivor and uh, a Nobel Peace Prize winner, he said we should stand up for all oppressed people. And there are many around the world, of course, as you know. So, as the great statesman and philosopher Edmund Burke said, the only thing necessary for evil to triumph is for good people to do nothing. And giving 
the disturbing and obvious rise in anti-Semitism and racism that's taken place, it's important that we should not appease attitudes and actions which must be called out for what they are, evil racism. Tomorrow, 11th of November, is Remembrance Day. We should all remember that many men and women of Australia and other democratic countries in the world fought against Nazi tyranny and totalitarianism for freedom. So let us all honour their members by being upstanders, not just bystanders. There must never be another crystal night or never, never be another show. Thank you.